So for the first hour, we're going to talk about Autopilot 101 and then going back to the basics of the, the various pieces involved. I had pulled up a slide deck that I had used I think the last time, probably five years ago at Microsoft to do this and then realized that I don't need a Microsoft presentation anymore. I need to turn this into an anti-Microsoft presentation. <laughs> I had to go through the logos and <laughs> put a little bit more personality into it. So we'll see how that goes. But so the basic idea, at least initially, is a refresher on the different autopilot capabilities and scenarios and those sorts of things. And then after lunch, we'll talk more about kind of behind the scenes and how things work. So to start off, helps to have a clicker that works. There we go. This was a slide from way back when that basically says, okay, the basic idea is the old way of deploying is expensive because you're going to take a device that shipped with the perfectly fine OS on it. You're going to build your own image. You're going to deploy that image and it's going to cost you a lot of time and money to maintain that image and actually do the deployment. The shift is to instead take a box, take PC out of the box, transform it through autopilot and Intune and pushing the configuration down to that device and now it's ready to use. The interesting piece is while that's the main scenario and how it's designed, every time I go to events and ask people, how are they doing autopilot? What they can come back with is something like this, which has just always puzzled me. They start off with a PC in a box that contains a perfectly functional OS. They then re-image it with something at least they're not building custom images most of the time for this. They're just using the standard uh, Microsoft install Win, maybe patching it, but not doing anything else to it. And then leveraging autopilot into to layer everything else on top of them. And they'll hook into that processes to register the device, get the autopilot profile on it. So running PowerShell is part of this. And it's kind of the almost the worst of all worlds that you still are doing imaging you're still having it be it driven rather than user driven because this is kind of a messy process to go through and yeah you end up with a modern device but the process that you use to get there wasn't particularly modern so this is one of those things that hopefully over time disappears maybe this is more of an, an interim step as people are moving from traditional imaging to Actually, using the image that ships from the OEM. Maybe this also reflects the fact that OEMs still ship too much crap on PCs outside of uh, Microsoft ships pretty clean PCs. Lenovo's PCs are pretty clean. HP, you can request a corporate ready image. Dell, you can buy a corporate ready image. So uh, the different OEMs do have options so that you could get away from these steps. But for a lot of people today, they are still doing imaging, even as part of the autopilot process. Whether the end user is doing the enrollment and they AAP join and in tune pieces themselves, or whether IT is doing that for them, kind of a mix both ways, but certainly over time, the goal would be to not be doing imaging and to be leveraging the end user to initiate the process so that you don't have an IT person who's sitting and watching this whole thing transpire. So let's go through kind of step by step in typical Microsoft style. Step number one, you need to buy stuff. What do you need to use autopilot? You need don't need to pay for autopilot itself it's free but you do need subscriptions that include intune and azure ad premium p1 or higher that would most easily be some sort of microsoft 365 
any subscription. The cheapest way you can probably go is a Microsoft 365 Business Premium subscription. My demo lab, I tend to use Business Premium because I can buy one license. It includes Azure AD, it includes Intune. Okay, I'm good to go. Uh, so you need some subscription that covers those, and you also need Windows Pro Enterprise or Education. It doesn't support home. But once you have those in place, at least you bought everything that you needed. The next step then, after you have the license, don't use autopilot, do a non-autopilot deployment. So when you try to do everything at once, biggest problem is people will say, okay, I'm gonna try this modern deployment, I'm gonna try out Intune, I'm gonna try out autopilot, I'm gonna do Azure AD join, I'm gonna throw all this stuff together and then I'm gonna push the button and it's all gonna work, right? Well. Odds are it's not all going to work. And then you have no idea how to troubleshoot it because you've done so many things at once, so many changes at once that now you don't know where to start with the troubleshooting process. So it's useful to start off simple. What would happen if I take a device out of the box, turn it on, boot it into Windows, go through UBI? Don't register it with autopilot. Just go through the UBI flow. The UBI flow is going to ask you a bunch of questions. It's going to say, is this a work or home PC? It's going to have you put in your Azure AD credentials. It's going to join the device to Azure AD. Azure AD, if it's configured properly, is going to then do an automatic Intune enroll. What's the difference between that and autopilot? Not a whole lot. You will get more questions during UBI. There are scenarios that autopilot supports that UBI doesn't. But at least you can go through UBI and do the simple Azure AD join via UBI to prove that you've got all the pieces configured. Now, those pieces include Azure AD company branding, uh, enabling subscription activation if you want to do automatic step up from Windows 11 Pro to Enterprise. Uh, you need to make sure that you've enabled users to enroll devices or to join devices to Azure AD. You need to have MDM uh, auto enrollment configured in Azure AD. You need to have Intune licenses assigned to users. If you're doing hybrid, you need AAD Connect to be synchronizing your users and devices uh, to and from the cloud. You need to make sure that you can reach the Azure AD services, the Intune services, and all the other pieces that are involved. So if you've got uh, 802.1x and authenticating proxies and SSL inspection and all these other complex things on your network. Uh, you need to make sure that you can actually get out. And uh, if you're doing hybrid, you need to be able to create objects, but uh, you wouldn't see that in this initial test. That's something to worry about later. So if you can go through Ubi, get a device joined to Azure AD and enrolled in Intune, you're 70% of the way there to autopilot. All autopilot ends up doing is simplifying the flow through UI. The end user would have to ask less questions. So let's look at what those uh, different pieces would look like. First, uh, to enable users to join uh, Azure AD, now called Enter ID, you have to go in and specify what users can join a device. Okay, that's not too hard. Just change it from none to all. You can put in company logos. Uh, you basically need to put in a square logo, a banner logo, and it's useful to have a background image to customize login experience. Easy enough. You need to configure auto enrollment for MDM. So you can go into Azure AD and under mobility MVM and Windows Insider, or sorry, Windows Information Protection, you can put in the standard URLs for Intune. It's pretty easy. You'll just click to select Intune, it'll populate the URLs for you. There are three of them. Basically, there's compliance, uh, discovery, and a terms of use URL. How many of you have ever seen the Intune uh, terms of use page? Probably no one because it's always turned off, but the URL is there. You'll actually see as you're going through the movie process, that page will flash up. 
it will flash blue. For some reason, they didn't bother updating it to use the new style sheet for Windows 11. So you can see it flash and then it goes away. So it doesn't do anything. If you ever wanted to put in your own custom terms of use page, like if you want to throw up a company banner or something like that, just substitute in your own URL for this and it will display it. Now, there are some rules for that terms of use page where you have to put in uh, a redirect to cause it to come back to PD. So the normal approach should be put up a page which has to fit into a very small rectangle that has a button on it. When they press the button, it redirects to a, a local app or else. So uh, it isn't that hard to do, but uh, that one's pretty inconsequential. Compliance URL, I have no idea what it does. It's configured. The discovery URL one is the important one. So that one's what points it to Intune so that it can complete the enrollment process. You need to assign licenses uh, through admin.microsoft.com. You can do it individually to users, which is great for testing. You can also click on groups and specify a group that should have a license applied, and then every user that you add automatically get that license applied. Again, here I've got a single Microsoft 365 Business Premium license in my account that's been assigned to my user so that it can successfully enroll devices in into. Question from audience. I, is Autopilot supported in GCC? No, uh, at least the last time I checked. I don't think that's changed. The, the basic problem with GCC, well, there are multiple, but the device registration service used for autopilot. So when you register a device with autopilot only exists in the public cloud and Windows only knows to check the public cloud for that device. So uh, challenges are first to get a, a version of that device registration service running on the cloud, have it properly segment the accounts, have some way in Windows being able to figure out should it go to the public cloud, should it go to GCC. Uh, all of those challenges haven't been solved. And I don't think in the last four years that there's been any real progress toward that. I, I put a link to licensing in the chat. So if anyone online wanted to see it, that's the shaman. Yeah, I can add quick comment on GCC. I work with government customers um, and I know the pain uh, things would be available in commercial tenant and not in GCC. Uh, Microsoft is kind of working toward it. One of the reasons that things are not available immediately in GCC because it needs to go through four different compliance programs. FedRAMP Moderate, CGIS, IS 1075, which takes time. But our commitment is try to make sure that every time there is a commercial release within 90, to 90 days to six months to get that release. So it's kind of org wise we are tracking that, but we do understand the pain. And I'm, I'm checking with my team. Uh, uh, Autopilot would be available in GCC for March. So yeah. March 2024, so maybe a couple of months. Progress. Someone yeah. posted in the chat saying that it's private preview right now. So it's in commercial, I think, yeah. GCC, GCC private preview. Um, I'm not, I'm going to butcher your name. Um, uh, Mitra. Okay, so I promise I only say names wrong. Yeah. And GCC, like, do they mean GCC moderate versus GCC high or DOD? Well, I'm sure it's not GCC high. Okay, I'll okay. think it's GCC high. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, maybe we'll get that figured out. But for now, yeah, it's uh, it, it is an education though, right? So a, yeah, education uses yeah uh, ASCMs standard commercial cloud. So uh, the licensing networking requirements. If you have a simple network, into Azure AD join, Intra ID join, whatever you want to call it. Uh, all of these things are simple because all you really need is unrestricted access out to the internet. No inbound access required. You just need access externally, unfiltered, undisturbed, unauthenticated to 
a whole bunch of Microsoft URLs. If you use an, oh, that's it, Paul. If you use an authenticating proxy, if you have firewalls that block access to, well, anything externally, you're probably going to spend a whole lot of time on the Windows Autopilot networking requirements page. And if you look at this page, the autopilot URLs are right here. Uh, ztd.pds.microsoft.com, pds.pds.microsoft.com, and login.live.com. Three of them. That's it. Everything else is needed for Azure AD and Intune and uh, Windows Update and Delivery Optimization Network Time Protocol. Surprising how many customers block NTP. So the machine can't sync its time, and if the time is off by too much, certificates aren't valid, and the whole thing just crumbles at that point. So NTP, DNS, uh, Windows Notification Services is required for MDN to work properly. Uh, if you wanted to install Office 365, Microsoft 365 apps from the cloud, you have to have access to that. Certificate revocation list, Windows expects to check those. If you block that, it's problematic. Uh, if you've got devices that don't have discrete TPMs, which is a whole bunch of devices now that use firmware TPMs, they don't have a cert in the TPM when the device ships. Instead, when the device boots up and tries to go out to a vendor URL and obtain a cert and store that into the TPM. So if you block those vendor TPM sites, you can never get a TPM cert and TPM annotation will never work. So this page is basically three autopilot URLs and then links to all those other requirements. So coming up with a list of things that you need to allow uh, is the, the merger of all of them. So expect that to take a lot of time if you have a complex network, make all those pieces work. Okay, if you're wanting to do hybrid Azure AD join with autopilot, there are some other pieces that are required. You do need to have AAD Connect in place. AAD Connect will create a service connection point in Active Directory. We're using how the device, when it joins to AD, knows what tenant it needs to talk to in Azure AD. So that's the pointer from AD to AAD. Uh, you can use ADFS, but uh, anymore, everything is moved toward AAD Connect or cloud-based replacements for that. So. Uh, if you're still using ADFS, ADFS probably time to stop. You do need to, for kind of the initial test, define a group policy to configure automatic enrollment into into. So the initial test would be again, don't do autopilot. Just take a machine, join it to Active Directory, and see if it gets enrolled in Intune. If it does. You've got AAD Connect in place and it's set up okay, the service connection points in place, and uh, the automatic enrollment's in place, the Intune licenses are in place, so everything would then just work. But uh, those are the pieces required to do that. So if you're going to go through Ubi and join a device to Azure AD, and enroll it in Intune without registering it with Autopilot. This is what it would look like. You start off, you choose a keyboard a region and the second key after the keyboard, which I've never seen anyone actually do. It checks for updates, which are really just critical to be fixes. And then it will ask you to review the license agreement. If you see this screen, this device isn't registered for autopilot. Autopilot has the option to turn this off, and most people would turn this off. So if you think this device is going to go through autopilot and you see this screen, just stop. Something's not right. You don't have this device registered properly. It doesn't have an autopilot profile assigned to it. Uh, it could be in a repair pending state because of hardware changes. There are various reasons that this could happen, but this is not autopilot if you see this. Okay, so after you accept the license terms,
It will ask you for your uh, account details. If you're doing this on Pro, it would also ask, is this a work or worker school or home machine? Since this is actually an enterprise image, it doesn't ask that, but you then put in your AAB credentials. It will ask for MFA. If you have that configured, fine, the MFA. And then it will continue on from there, joining the device to Azure AD, enrolling it in Intune, and then continuing through UBI. This would be the next sign that the device isn't registered with Autopilot because all the rest of the UBI screens that you would see would be turned off for an Autopilot registered device. That the IT admin would have defaults. They would configure those defaults to suppress these pages and configure the settings via into policies. Other than that, this is really the exact same process as an autopilot enrollment with no enrollment status page and with some extra screens added into UBI. If you're doing hybrid, if you manually join a device to Active Directory and you had the necessary policies and definitions in place, AAD Connect properly configured. The only thing that you're going to notice is when it shows connected to your AD domain, there will be an info button in settings. If you click that, it will show you your Intune enrollment details. And if you check DS Reg Command status, you should see it show both domain join equals yes, that's Active Directory, and Azure AD join yes, that means it's registered with Azure AD as well. That's a proper hybrid device. But that at least proves that everything's set up properly. A device, can I get it registered? Can I get it enrolled in Intune? Okay, now that we've done all of that, now we're ready to move to the next step of Autopilot. So just to summarize, uh, if you can do all that stuff without Autopilot, what are the benefits of Autopilot? Well, you can turn off the extra pages in Ubi. Uh, the initial announcements for Autopilot, uh, the marketing pages that the engineers came up with said, see, Ubi had 17 pages before Autopilot, and with Autopilot, it only had five. So we reduced 12 pages out of Ubi, to which we said, well, that's kind of silly that you're making the marketing message saying, Microsoft made this overly complicated, and now we've released a solution that simplifies it again. Well, maybe Microsoft should get rid of all of those Ubi pages, so it's not so complicated in the first place, and then you wouldn't need Autopilot at all. But fortunately, there is more to it. Uh, normally, a device, when it goes through Ubi and the user joins it to Azure AD, they get admin rights to the machine by default. You don't want them to have admin rights. You need Autopilot. The device needs to be registered with Autopilot, and in the Autopilot profile, you can say turn off admin rights. Now, the AAD guys decided, well, we don't really want Autopilot to have that as an exclusive feature. So they added it to Azure AD as well. There is a setting in Azure AD where you can say users should get admin rights by default. So that one's kind of gone away, but uh, it was one of the initial set points. Blocking access to the desktop until the device is ready to use. The enrollment status page was uh, a common customer request saying, okay, we see that you can go through UV, you can join AAD, we'll get enrolled into the user gets dropped to the desktop and there's nothing there, and they don't know what to do. So they call the help desk. The help desk just tells them, just sit, wait, be patient. The office will show up shortly. The other apps will get delivered. The policies will be applied. And somewhere in the next uh, hour or two, your device will be ready for productive use. That didn't fly. So as a result, the enrollment status page was created to be able to say, let's block until all that stuff's done. So by the time the user sees the desktop, they're ready to be productive and they're not looking around to say, well, where's all my stuff? Now, the interesting piece is technically you can use the enrollment status page without autopilot. If you create an enrollment status page profile in Intune and assign that to all users and then go through Ubi with a device that isn't registered with autopilot, it will display ESP and block until everything you've specified is completed. So 
is ESP an autopilot feature or is it an enrollment feature? can't believe the number of meetings that happened just to answer that question. And at the end of the day, there really was no satisfactory answer. But since you can use it without autopilot, technically it's not an autopilot feature at the moment. There's always the possibility of changing that and saying, well, the ESP settings and the autopilot profile will be merged together and you'll get one object. And at that point, it becomes hard to have ESP settings without an autopilot registered device, so maybe they'll change that. But at the moment, you can use ESP without an autopilot. The other thing then is the additional scenarios that autopilot adds. Movie can only do AAE join, so autopilot adds hybrid so that you can join a device into uh, Active Directory and register it with Azure AD. It supports a self-deploying mode where you can just turn on the device and it provisions itself so it doesn't require any user credentials. Instead, it does TPM attestation to uh, magic service on the web. So if you get an Azure AD token and join the device to Azure AD and roll it into it without the user ever doing anything, and you can do pre-provisioning where Hit the Windows key five times on the first screen of movie. It comes up with menu. You can choose pre provisioning. The technician can then get everything loaded onto the device. When they're done, they shut the device down, ship it to the end user. The end user turns it on. It goes back into movie. They put in their credentials, and the device joins AAD and rolls it into, except it already was. And it waits in ESP for any software to be installed, but it's already installed. So as far as the user is concerned, it's just a super fast autopilot process because everything was already there. So those scenarios are autopilot specific. Is that, is that kind of like that scenario where your, your deployment guys can't go over just sending the device to someone? So like they want to log in, make sure everything's there, make sure it's right. But then still get the benefit of autopilot. Or normal case is if you're the type of company that has 37 agents that need to be installed on the machine, <laughs> having those deployed via Intune could take 90 minutes. Well, I'm not willing to sit, watch, and stare at a progress dialog for 90 minutes to get to my desktop. I need it now. So in that case, the technician can initiate that, wait for 90 minutes, but then ship the device to the end user and now the end user only has to wait five because everything's already there. So the Autodesk people? The we are special crap. Uh, okay. The people who aren't willing to be sitting in front of, of a machine for any significant length of time are waiting for it to be provisioned. So the C-suite. Well, there's in our uh, thing, I'd argue, we use that for like, countries such as India, where someone might not have good internet at their home. So even downloading the office suite would take a day or more. So our IT can pre-provision that before it's sent out. Yeah. yeah, and there are certainly cases for that, which is why it was designed so that you just enable it in the autopilot profile. But that doesn't mean you have to use it. Yeah. So you can choose device by device, which ones do you want to pre which ones do you want to get all that stuff put on the device before it's shipped out? Um, the other interesting piece is the second footnote, additional scenarios to be performed that are not possible without autopilot device registration. Technically, you can put an autopilot configuration file that JSON into the right location on the Windows device even when it's not registered, called autopilot for existing devices. And in that case, it doesn't need to be registered, but it will still go through the normal autopilot flow or user-driven AAD join or user-driven hybrid join. So those work well. If you look in the documentation, it talks more about the uh, autopilot for existing devices as part of a config manager task sequence so that you would push out a task sequence that re-images the device. Maybe you want to go from, well, at the time, Windows 7 or Windows 8.1 to Windows 10, but now maybe you want to wipe and load to go from 10 to 11. You could do that, not register the device with autopilot, put the JSON file in place and have it behave like an autopilot registered device. 
and then let Intune grab the hardware hash from the machine after the fact of registry. But kind of a specialized case. Okay, so we've bought licenses. We've made sure that we have all the configuration in place. We can do a non-autopilot AAB join and get it rolled in into it. We can get a device hybrid register, all that good stuff. Now we need to do some autopilot stuff. So we need to create things in into. <laughs> we need autopilot deployment profiles to specify what scenario we want to do. User-driven AAD join, user-driven hybrid join. Uh, those are the most common self-deploying AAD join in the case where you just want a device to deploy itself, which is great for kiosk, in client type devices, in those where there really isn't going to be a primary user of the device. You assign those profiles to a group inside of Intune, and Intune then takes care of any device that gets put into that group, gets the autopilot profile set. Second, you need an enrollment status page profile. Basically, that will specify how long it should wait, uh, what, it, what should it do in case of errors. There's basic settings in there. You can specify which, which applications are considered critical, which ones it should wait on. Anything not in that list of critical apps and install in the background over time so the end user doesn't have to sit and wait for it. The gotcha with that one is that you can tell it not to wait for them, but you can't tell it to only deploy the ones that they're waiting for and keep all the others until later in tune. If you've got 20 apps and you're saying only wait for two, it's going to send all 20 to the device. Now, when those two finish, it will continue and the other 18 will run in the background. But if the two that you're waiting for happen to install last, you're still going to wait for all 20 because it has to get those two installed or continue. So that gets a little messy. If you're doing hybrid, there's also a domain join profile that basically specifies here's the name of my Active Directory, here's the OU uh, that I want to put this device in, and here's the name prefix that I want to put on that device. Assign that to all devices so that any device being deployed by autopilot that's doing hybrid Azure AD join can find one of these. Many people try to get fancier than that, and uh, there are issues with the multiple devices with hybrid Azure AD join in AAD and targeting and in tune, and it gets really messy. So uh, just keep it simple. Have one, sign into all devices, and everything will be okay. The enrollment status page profile has basic settings. You choose user driven, you choose enter joint or hybrid uh, AADJ. You can hide the terms of use, you can hide the privacy and security settings. Uh, you can specify admin versus standard. You can enable pre provisioning if you want to do that. You can configure the language and keyboard, but those only work if the device has network connectivity at the time that UI starts. If you're connecting a deployment device over Wi-Fi, there's a catch-22. You can't push down language and keyboard settings to the device before it's connected to the network because you need the language and keyboard in order to connect to Wi-Fi. So uh, that only works for an Ethernet connected machine. In case of Ethernet connected machine, as soon as it boots up, it gets an IP address, downloads the profile, and that shows that, oh, hey, I don't need to prompt. I've configured this in the autopilot file, but if you're only doing uh, Wi Fi, no one never use it. You can name the devices using the template. In the Azure AD join case, uh, you'll actually see the device boot up. If you connect it to Wi-Fi, it would then download the autopilot profile, see the name, and reboot the computer, which is OK. Uh, it just adds an extra profile, an extra rebooted process, because you can't rename a computer in, you can't rename Windows, a Windows computer without rebooting the computer. So you will see an extra reboot if you use a, a name template. The enrollment status page configuration. Um, 
Most of the time, you're going to have the first option set to yes. So do you want to show progress? You can specify a timeout. That has to be a worst case timeout. So if you've got a machine connecting over a very slow internet connection, like one in India, you can't put in a 60 minute timeout and expect it to work everywhere in the world. So you might need to put in a three hour timeout, or five hour timeout, or a 24 hour timeout, because it might take significantly longer in some locations. The downside of that is if anything doesn't work, I, let's say you have an application that fails, you're not going to find out that that application failed until that timeout happens. So if I put three hours in here and 30 seconds into the process that app install fails, it's not going to tell me that that app failed for three hours. I'm just going to sit there and wonder why isn't it doing anything? What's, what's going on behind the scenes? And then it's going to tell me a timeout. Well, that's not helpful because it's not going to tell me why did it time out. It's not going to tell me that an application failed and that caused the timeout. So less the desirable behavior on that. There are certain options uh, to enable a user to collect logs to uh, show patient devices. Oh, this is what was an option added in the case of a non autopilot device. You can actually hide ESP so that it only applies to autopilot devices, which is useful. Uh, blocking, generally you're not going to use ESP without blocking, but uh, if you turn this off, there would be a continue anyway button so that the user can skip forward and get to the desktop even if it's not ready. Uh, if there's a failure, you can enable <coughs> users to click a reset button and try again. And after an hour of resetting Windows, it would then go back through the unique process and let you make another attempt at it. And uh, the, the list of apps that you want to block on by default is set to all. If you change it to selected, you can then choose a list of apps that it should wait for. Everything else that's not in that list won't wait. This doesn't mean that those are the apps that are going to be delivered. It means that it's a filter. So let's say you push 10 apps from into and your selected app list has 15 apps in it. That doesn't mean it's going to wait for 15 apps. It means it's going to look at those 10, see if any of those 10 are in the list of 15. If, say, five of them are in that merged uh, intersection, it's going to wait for those five before it allows access to the desktop. The main join profile, super simple, naming prefix. So uh, it'll generate a 15 character computer name using the prefix that you specify. Keep it short. Like in this case, I did DJ dash, and it will then fill 12 characters or random garbage numbers, letters, uppercase, lowercase, as the devs thought Windows computer names were case sensitive. Uh, but it does that. Uh, the domain name, you have to specify that so it knows which domain to join it into, and optionally, you can configure an OU to put the computer in. Uh, it's best to keep it simple, have one of these, all machines go into the same OU, uh, and use a naming prefix that you probably won't like, but you can always rename it later. I was going to say, so there's no option to be able to use like a serial number or anything on the computer to create the name? No, because the name that's generated uh, is generated by the Intune connector for AD. So it doesn't know any of that information, so it has no way of doing that. We had a number of feature designs to change that so that the client would calculate the computer name and pass that up to Intune, and then Intune could create the object through the connector, but none of that was ever implemented. Not yet. Given the fact that they would really rather you never use hybrid Azure AD join and autopilot now, they're probably never going to make any improvements to this. So okay. you're stuck with a randomly computer, random, uh, randomly generated computer name with a weird character. Okay, so you've got the autopilot profiles, one or more. You've got the ESP profiles, probably only one. You've got a domain join profile, hopefully only one if you're doing hybrid, zero otherwise. Now you can register devices. The registration process, the best way of doing that is to do it at purchase. 
So if you buy a device from an OEM or a reseller, you can just tell them to register the device. <clears throat> they can take the serial number, the manufacturer, the model of the machine and register it directly with the autopilot service using that. Uh, if you do it, you have to get the full 4,000 character hardware hash and upload that to Intune in order to register the device. That's great as a fallback plan and for testing, but it's kind of painful to do over and over again for every new device that you get in to register. If your process involves running get Windows Autopilot info on PS1 or the unit equivalent to that, which has a few extra features, uh, if you do that on every single machine, you're probably not doing this right because that's a whole bunch of extra work. Where it gets even more interesting is the OEM, when they register a device, they can't put it in an AAD group because they don't have access to your AAD. So they will put a group tag on the device. You can tell them what group tag to assign. And you can then build a dynamic group at AAD that says, give me all the devices that have that group tag. So it's an indirect way of determining group membership and what profile should be assigned based on that group membership. If you're doing the same thing for manually registered devices, yeah, you're not doing it right. Because why would you put why would you register a device with a group tag to get it dynamically added into a group when you could just add it directly to the group at the same time you're registering it? So there is an add to group option on the script. You can just add it to the group directly and save all that trouble. Dynamic Azure AD groups are okay if you have to use them. They're not super fast, but they do work. Direct uh, assigned membership into an AAD group is so much better. So. Just specify the group that you want to drop it into. The list of OEMs and resellers that will register devices for you is quite extensive. Some of them will charge, some of them won't. Uh, it just depends. So if you want to get them to register the devices, just reach out to each of them. The OEMs, the device manufacturers from the authorization process, actually so do the device resellers, where they'll send you an email that you have to have a global admin accept to say, yes, I give this particular company permissions to register devices into my Azure AD tenant on my behalf. But that's all it gives them the ability to do is they can register devices or online. It works well. Uh, if you're willing to pay a little, a little money to do that. If you wanted to manually register it, this is what it would generally look like. So you boot up a machine into UBI. Uh, once it gets into the first screen in UBI, you can press Shift F10 to open a command prompt. From that command prompt, you can run PowerShell. Once you're in PowerShell, you have to set the execution policy. Then you can install the script from the PowerShell gallery. In this case, I installed the community version, so get Windows Auto Cloud Community. That will install the script. When you run the script, you can specify a bunch of command line parameters. In this case, we'll do online because we wanted to talk to Intune directly instead of creating a CSV. We can specify a group that the device should be dropped into. And we can tell it to wait for the autopilot profile to be assigned. So once the script completes, we know that it's been registered with autopilot. The autopilot profile has been assigned and it's ready to perform. It needs a few Microsoft Graph modules to complete that task, so it installs those dynamically. After that's done, it will need to authenticate with Azure AD, so it'll pop up a dialog for us to do that. And then it will do the rest of the task. It did generate an error when I did this, but it worked anyway. I haven't had a chance to investigate what that error means. I think it happened because my tenant didn't have permission to use the graph modules when I first ran it. 
and then it asked for permission to do that, and then tried again, but it did look weird as it was going through that. Sign in as an admin account on the tenant. Pay. Give permissions. That's the error that I was referring to before. And then it it boards the device, so it generates the hardware hash CSV pretty quickly, uploads that into it, and then it just sits there and waits by polling to see is it ready, is it ready, is it ready, uh, and eventually it will come back and say, okay, I see the profile's been assigned. Now I'm going to put the uh, device into the group. So it just goes through this series of steps and eventually says, okay, it's ready to go. At that point, you could just reboot the computer. It would try again to download the autopilot profile, see that, okay, now this is an autopilot device and would be ready to go. There is an option in the script to basically add dash reboot and it would take care of that automatically. In this case, I didn't do that, but you could see 152 seconds, so what, two and a half minutes to get the device registered and properly synced into, into AAE and uh, the autopilot service. Not too bad. Great for testing in VMs. There are some complications in VMs with autopilot markers. We'll talk about that after lunch. But it's registration process itself is not too bad. You could generate a CSV and take that CSV to Intune and upload it, but why bother if you can just add a switch onto the script? Have that do it differently. Store for business is going away. Uh, resellers will use Partner Center to do the same thing. They will take a big CSV and upload it to Partner Center to register devices. For some reason, there's still the ability to do this via the Microsoft 365 business uh, portal. Well, I don't know anyone who's ever used it in that portal, but just do it through it too. You then end up with a list of devices in Intune. You can see there profile status is assigned. That means that it's registered with autopilot. It's properly got a, a profile assigned to it. It's ready to deploy. Uh, if you see devices in this fixed pending state, and it's not a device that you have shipped to an OEM for repair and they shipped it back to you with a new motherboard, that's bad. That's a machine that's going to permanently be stuck in that state. If you do see that, Deregister the device from autopilot, re-upload the hash, re-register it, and go through the process again. That'll disappear. But uh, that, we'll talk more about that after lunch. At that point, we're ready to provision. We can do any of these scenarios. Most common user-driven Azure AD join, Hedra ID join. Uh, second most is probably hybrid, and then self-deploying comes in a distant third. Uh, we talked a little bit about autopilot for existing devices before and reprovisioning as an option. If we wanted to do the Azure AD join approach, it's going to be the same movie experience that we started out with, with less screens. So we'll still choose the keyboard and region. We'll still Authenticate with Azure AD. Generally updates. Reboot in here because I have a computer naming template specified in the autopilot profile to have a custom generated name. So it reboots and then movie starts up again. None of these videos are real time because we'd be here for probably an extra three or four hours. So these are all edited for time. Your patience for editing, uh, just chopping out little dead time pieces, the more you do, the less you want to edit them. So uh, the first few I did, I'd get them nice, short, down to about a minute. And then by the end, it's like, oh, this is now a two or three minute video. Close Basic enough. idea. Come Close enough. enough. Yeah. <laughs> this means that I had to talk more while it displays progress bars, but 
we put in our credentials at this point the device is joining active directory and enrolling in intune and getting an initial policy pushed down to it which will say turn on the enrollment status page so the next step is we see esp esp goes through a device preparation phase which is kind of housekeeping type stuff you'll always see that it goes through those first three items super quick because they don't really do anything. It's this fourth one that always takes time preparing your device for mobile management. What's it waiting for? Waiting for the Intune management extension first to install and second to figure out what Win32 apps need to be deployed to the machine. And that's a surprisingly slow process that can take longer than installing the apps, depending on what your apps are. So. Not, not uncommon for that to be somewhere in the one to five minute range, just waiting to figure out what to do, and then it will start installing the applications. While this still says identifying, it's waiting for the Intune management extensions to calculate what apps are needed. So once it did that, we see it switched to zero to now we see here, I'm popping up an MPT task sequence. One of my Win32 apps is actually a task sequence that installs a bunch of other apps. You can do fancy things like that. Win32 app can do anything at once. So we've got one of those and another application that's being installed. It can track certificates. If you've got security profiles targeting the machine, I don't in this case. If you had VPN or Wi-Fi connections, it'll track those. But the security settings that it tracks, there's like a list of five that it tracks. So it's not tracking much of anything. Most of the time, you'll just see it complete uh, one of one. And what it's tracking is actually, does this machine have an Intune ID? Which the answer is yes. So as a result, it will always complete very quickly. There's reasonings for that. Initially, the goal was to track all targeted uh, policies being pushed to the device. So we wouldn't let you get to the desktop and sign in until all the policies were received. But guess what? A lot of Intune policies fail. And if we tracked all of them and caused a failure, if any of those policies fail, your success rate through autopilot would be somewhere around 1%. So as a result, we just don't track policies like that. So they're just too problematic. A lot of them resolve themselves later. Like you can push out a BitLocker policy that fails initially, and then later, once you're at the desktop, succeeds. So if we caused a failure in ESP, well, that would be unproductive because it's an issue that's going to work itself out. But we get to the desktop. In this case, that second app that I ran was the autopilot branding package. So it set the background, it uh, configured the start menu layout, it did a whole bunch of things. So. Uh, we do have the apps that were installed by the MVP task sequence. So all that's been done. We're at the desktop. We're ready for productive use of the machine. Hybrid case is pretty much the exact same thing. You just have to kind of understand the, the extra pieces in the flow where we will uh, get the autopilot profile. We'll go through an MDM enrollment. Eventually, the machine will signal to Intune that it needs an ODJ blob, so it has to talk to a domain controller. Uh, it will send that ODJ blob back to the machine. The machine can, uh, it is joined to Active Directory at that point, but it has to talk to the domain controller again before it can receive GPOs, before it can push up a computer certificate into AD. Before that happens, it's unable to sync it to uh, AAD. So lots of things going on that require connectivity to the domain controller. So you need to have an always on VPN connection or something like that, or only deploy these on the corporate network in order for this process to work well. The flow that you would see is not really going to be any different. The only thing that you'll see that might be a little different is the uh, there'll be an extra weight. So when the OD, ODJ blob is received by the machine, it has to reboot in order to complete the join. So we'll see that happen as well. Otherwise, it's the same flow. That's that terms of use page that I mentioned before.
Basically, now it waits for the ODA blob. It's received it. Complete the domain join. It will reboot. After the reboot, then we can show the ESP and continue tracking from that point. Now, the device ESP in a hybrid Azure AD join case is fine and always works, but the user ESP doesn't because the hybrid device registration generally hasn't happened by the time the user signs in. If the device registration hasn't happened when the user signs in, they don't get an Azure AD user token. As a result, the user can't talk to Intune. If you can't talk to Intune and ESP is waiting for Intune to tell it what to do, you're stuck. So the only thing that can happen in that case is ESP to timeout. So as a result, if you're doing hybrid, just always turn off user ESP. But otherwise, it looks the same. We'll install our, install our apps, and then the process will complete. Now, we can't automatically log in as the user. The user will have to put in their Active Directory credentials after this process completes. Uh, but that authenticates with the Active Directory domain controller and continues the process for sure. Then, the log on screen. And we can log in as long as we have connectivity to the main controller. And we see the normal experience from there. Uh, what's wrong with hybrid Azure AD join? Go into a room with Microsoft people or MVPs that mention autopilot hybrid Azure AD join. Watch them all jump on top of you and tell you, don't do this. <laughs> well, yeah, there are reasons to not do it, but there are also things that you need to do in order to be ready for Azure AD join that maybe you haven't done yet. So it's one of those cases where, where do you put your focus? Do you try to get ready for Azure AD join and leave your existing deployment process in place? Or do you first tackle your deployment process and move to autopilot and hybrid Azure AD join while those auto, while those Azure AD join pieces are still progressing separately. If it's you doing both of those things, getting ready for Azure AD join or doing the deployment process, no brainer, you'll do Azure AD join. But if you're the deployment person and you're waiting for some other team to complete all the work necessary to fully support Azure AD join, you might be waiting a year because you don't know where that's at on their priority list. They may never get to it. So as a result, you could move to autopilot, do hybrid Azure AD join in the short term, and know that, say, a year from now, you change that over to Azure AD join instead. But it's not awful. You just need to understand what's going on. The Microsoft messaging is going to be for cloud native. You want to get to Azure AD Join. It's inevitable. You will get there. They're going to push you one way or another to get into Azure AD. There are design flaws in the hybrid Azure AD implementation, like computer naming is an obvious one, but there are others that you'll see. There are limitations in Active Directory for internet connecting machines. You have to have a always on VPN connection in order to make that really be effective. And because Microsoft doesn't want you to use it, they really don't test much with hybrid, so things will break. So it, it does have some risks, but there are things that you can do to make better. Always on VPN, there's a skip AD connectivity check, which will at least enable it to complete when it's not on the corporate network. Turn off user ESP since it won't work anyway. Target your domain joint profile of all devices. And if you're doing certificates, you probably want to serve to have the right uh, common name. So make sure that that includes fully qualified domain name in the certificate profile so that it waits until after the ODJ reboot to generate that cert. But I got all that covered in a blog post, so we can go over that. Self-deploying mode does TPM attestation. I wasn't, I didn't have a, a physical PC sitting around to re-record this for Windows 11. So I kept using my old Windows 10 video, but the basic idea is it boots up, it gets the autopilot profile. In this case, the device is Ethernet connected, so it doesn't need to ask for anything. 
and it just goes. So it will join Azure AD, it'll enroll in Intune, it will push the policies down. The device preparation completes fairly quickly. The device setup is going to push down apps and whatever else you need. Now, this device won't have any primary user associated with it because it was a userless deploy. So that's why it's most suited for kiosk type machines. But you can use that to deploy kiosk digital signs, uh, in clients, some of those sorts of things. Autopilot for existing devices. Again, made a whole lot of sense when you're running Windows 7 or 8.1, you've got data in between, you want to do migration of that, you want to get the device to Windows 10, but you also want to move it to, say, Azure AD join at the same time. You can use a task sequence to initiate that. So you kick that off via config manager. The end result is you push down a new Windows image with drivers. It moves up, sees the autopilot configuration file.json, and goes to the Let's go past you. Let's go ahead. We eventually get to the point where you can put in your email account, do the Azure AD join. To ESP. Eventually, you end up at the desktop. And because you could do USMT as part of the task sequence, you can actually get your data back as well. So, fun stuff like that. Pre provisioning. Uh, normal autopilot flow is the OEM puts the image and drivers on the device. The end user sits and waits for minutes or hours for everything to be applied. The idea is you can put a step in the middle where an IT person pre-provisions the device. Uh, so that's what autopilot pre-provisioning is about. When you're on the first screen in Ubi, if you hit the Windows key five times, you'll see another screen pop up where you can choose Windows autopilot provisioning. This only works on a physical machine. You can't do it in a VM because it uses TPM attestation. It doesn't work in a VM, so you always have to test it on a physical PC. But it will go through the provisioning process with very little additional input required. You just click the provision button, it goes, no credentials, no passwords to worry about. It'll provision the device. Afterwards, it reseals the device, so it shuts it down, so that when it boots up the next time, it starts over at the beginning of Ubi but we'll use the existing AAD join, the existing MPM enrollment, and quickly complete because all this stuff was done previously. Now let's get to the end. Green screen, success. Red screen, failure. So the technicians can watch a room full of PCs doing this and know which ones are done. They just need to go by and Click the reseal button to shut it down. And then it goes to the user, and the user does a normal autopilot process after that. That's it.